Shalom Chavrim. I'm Stephen Benoon. You're watching the Noon Institute of Biblical Research here on the Noon Institute YouTube channel here. And uh, it's really about probably our one of our first videos here where we actually get to sit down and look at some scriptures here together uh, in light of uh, things that may be, that we might be seeing on the horizon in the very near future. An event that... Uh, many have been looking forward to and that is the day that Israel's eyes begin to open to recognize her own uh, Messiah and so if you happen to have your Bible I'd like to go over to uh, the very famous pa passage in the book of Romans and we'll look right here uh, about the olive trees there this is where uh, the wild olive tree the natural olive tree um, that uh, Paul speaks about. Verse 1, it starts off, And I say then, hath God cast away his people? God forbid, for I am also an Israelite of the seed of Abraham, of the tribe of Benjamin. Uh, and of course, the Benjamin also, if you remember, even at the time of Paul, we were still dealing with the split of the two houses, the house of um, Judah and the house of Israel, uh, where the house of Israel had already gone into captivity. The house of Judah still remained in the land up until 70 AD, uh, which is something I might share with you guys here on Zanun Institute. I had done a video that I put out on Israeli News Live where I spoke uh, pretty much in depth about the temple uh, with Roddy Brown. And I'd mentioned before him, before going on there, you know, that, you know, was the Temple Mount, is it actually Jewish? And I said, yes, it is. A lot of people came back and said, no, it's not. It's not Jewish. It's an Israelite, uh, it's an Israelite uh, or an Abrahamic uh, Mount, not a Jewish site. And let me, let me clarify that a little bit more, though, because if we really think about it, yes, the first temple that went up was when both uh, Solomon built it when all of Israel was at peace. There was not a division of the house of Judah and the house of, of, uh, of uh, Israel at that time. That came after Solomon's death, and then they did split off. Uh, but if you think about it, yes, Solomon is of the tribe of Judah. Uh, and the very expression we say today, Jewish, comes from the tribe of Judah, those that are the descendants of the tribe of Judah and even of the house of Israel. Uh, Paul called us Jews, even in his own writings there. So uh, it refers more as conclusive as the house of Judah, including the Benjamites, the Levites, the house of Judah. Uh, all, all three of these tribes are concluded into the selfsame one as the house of Judah or Jews, as you were to say. So, technically speaking, it's still a Jewish site because it's where Solomon built the temple. But, let's look at it also in the, in the, in the light of the fact, too, that yes, uh, it was a house of prayer built for all nations. So, not just for Israel, but it's also for the Gentiles to come and to pray. There was a court for the Gentiles, etc., so, yes, it is an Abrahamic uh, site as well, but it was never Abraham's intention to build a temple. In fact, Moses was the first one to make a, a temple, so to speak, in the, in the wilderness journey, but it was made up of all skins, as Roddy brings out in that message as well. What's the one thing about the temple in the wilderness with Moses and the temple on uh, Mount Moriah here that, were, that was different? Uh, the temple there that Solomon built was made of stone. The temple that Moses built was made of skins and was portable, could be moved around. And that's really what God was looking for when it came to a temple. He was looking for a human body that he could live in, that he could rest his, his, his own head in. Uh, as Yeshua said when he was here on the earth, he said, uh, The Son of Man hath no place to lay his head. Our heart was supposed to be where he laid it at. Remember, John actually laid his head on Yeshua's bosom. See, looking for a place to lay his head. That's where he would like to lay his head tonight for you, right on your own heart. Anyway, let's continue on here. We'll drop down to verse 7. What then Israel hath not obtained that which he seeketh for, but the election hath obtained it, and the rest were blinded. 
because uh, he talks about how that Israel goes into blindness because of not receiving the gospel at that time. It says, according as it written, God hath given them the spirit of slumber eyes that they should not see and ears that they should not hear unto this day. And David saith, let their table be a snare and a trap and a stumbling block and a recompense unto them. Let their eyes be darkened that they may not see. And bow down there and back always. That's in verse 10, Romans chapter 11. Uh, continuing on with verse 11. And I say then, have they stumbled that they should fall? God asks, I mean, Paul asks that question. Have they stumbled that they should go, fall? But he says, God forbid, but rather through their fall, salvation has come unto the Gentiles for to provoke them to jealousy. Now, if the fall of them be the riches of the world and the diminishing of them, the riches of the Gentiles, how much more their fullness? For I speak to you Gentiles insomuch as I am an apostle of the Gentiles. I magnify in mine office if by any means I may provoke to emulation them which are my flesh and might save some of them. For if the casting away of them be reconciliation of the world, what shall the receiving of them be but life from the dead? He goes on to say in verse 16, For if the first fruit be holy, the lump is also holy. If the root be holy, so are the branches. And if some of the branches be broken off, that, uh, and thou being a wild olive tree, were grafted in among them, and, and with them partakest of the root and the fatness of the olive tree, Boast not against the branches, but if thou boast, thou bearest not the root, but the root thee. Okay? Thou will say then, the branches were broken off that I might be grafted in. Well, because of unbelief. They were broken off, and you stand by faith. Be not high-minded, but fear, for if God spared not the natural branches, take heed lest he also spare not you. Interesting, isn't it? The analogy that Paul gives here about the wild olive tree and the natural olive tree, a type of the Gentiles and the Jews, and also speaking about how he'll regraft them in. Watch what he goes on to say. Verse 22, Behold, therefore, the goodness and severity of God on them which fell severity, but toward the, the goodness, if you continue in his goodness, otherwise thou also shall be cut off. And they also, if they abide not still in unbelief, shall be grafted in, for God is able to graft them in again. And that's what we're about to see. Okay? For if, if you were cut out of the olive tree which is wild by nature, and were grafted contrary to nature into a good olive tree, how much more shall these which be the natural branches be grafted into their own olive tree? For I would not, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own conceit, that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. And also, excuse me, and so all Israel shall be saved as it is written. There shall come out of Zion the deliverer and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. For this is my covenant unto them when I shall take away their sins. And as concerning the gospel, they are enemies for your sakes, but as touching the election, they are beloved of the Father's sakes. For the gift of calling, calling of God are without repentance. For as you in times past have not believed God, yet have now obtained mercy through their unbelief, even so have these also now not believed that through your mercy also may obtain mercy. For God hath concluded them all in unbelief that he might have mercy upon all. You know, an interesting thought I wanted to share with you here is, is a couple of things here. If you look at verse 26 where it says, and so, all they shall all, and so all Israel shall be saved as it is written, there shall come out of Zion the deliverer and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. That actually comes from Isaiah, or at least is what they believe it is, Isaiah uh, chapter 59 um, in verse 20. 
And it states there in Isaiah, it says, And the Redeemer shall come to Zion, and to them that turn from transgression. And Jacob saith the Lord. Now, all Israel shall be saved is speaking more of the remnant of Israel that would have believed, but God put them into a, a, a state of blindedness and blinded them so that the Gentiles might have sight. And this is one thing that a lot of people so, get so mixed up is that, well, Israel missed the boat. They didn't believe Yeshua when he came. They ain't going to never be saved from here on out. And that's just not the case. It's just not the case at all. But another one I want to share with you, because when you really begin to look at these passages about, you know, the, you know out, of, out, out of Zion, excuse me, going back to that again in verse 26 there, chapter 11, Romans, um, there shall come out of uh, Zion, as they're using the Greek terminology, but a Zion, uh, the deliverer, and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. Another thing that comes to my mind is Obadiah's prophecy. In Obadiah, there's two different ones we can see in verse 17 and also verse 21. Verse 17 says, But uh, upon Mount Zion shall be deliverance, okay? And there shall be holiness, and the house of Jacob shall possess their possessions. Now, see, that seems to go more in line than the scripture that they, they, they try to put it on to in Isaiah 59, 20, when it says, And the Redeemer shall come to Zion, and to them that turn from transgression, and to Jacob saith the Lord. But when you look over here in Romans, he says, There shall come out of Zion the Deliverer. All right? And shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. Go to, go to Obadiah. Chapter 1, verse 17, But upon Zion shall be deliverance, and there shall be holiness, and the house of Jacob shall possess their possessions. And when you get down to verse 21, it says, And deliverers, or saviors, either way you want to translate it, shall come up on Mount Zion to judge the Mount of Esau, and the kingdom shall be the Lord's. That's the beginning of the two witnesses' ministry, and now we know where their ministry even begins. Starts right there on Mount Zion. That's something I've always thought was kind of interesting. I want to share with you a few other things though, about Mount Zion that maybe you've not seen or thought about before. And another one is found in the book of Joel. Uh, if we look at Joel 2, uh, chapter 2, verse 31 and 32, it says, The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and terrible day of the Lord uh, comes. Or come. Uh, let, me, let me back up a little further. Let's go, let's go to verse 29. Um, uh, maybe verse 28 would be better. And it shall come to pass afterward, chap Joel chapter 2, verse 28, Afterwards, that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, your old men shall see dreams, or shall dream dreams, and your young men shall see visions. And also upon the servants and upon the handmaids in those days will I pour out my spirit. I will show wonders in the heavens and the earth, blood, fire, and pillars of smoke. Right? The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and terrible day of the Lord come. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be delivered. For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem shall be deliverance as the Lord has said, and in the remnant whom the Lord shall call. I mean, you guys remember the scripture where it says that take hold of the skirt of him that is a Jew and say, show us your ways. We hear God is with you. When are they going to say that? They're going to say it when there's deliverance. And where is it going to begin? Right on Mount Zion. You know, I've held this back for a long time talking about this. I've known this for, for some time now that, that your two witnesses, the ministry will begin right there on Mount Zion in Jerusalem. And it's laying there in your scripture everywhere right before your eyes. Again, Verse 32 of Joel chapter 2, And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be delivered. That, by the way, is capital L-O-R-D. That's the divine name that people think they know and don't know it. When you know how to call upon His name, how do you do that? How would you know how to do it? Well, let me tell you something. Zephaniah says, 
there's coming that time when people will be able to do that. Uh, let me just pull that up for you because I want you to see Zephaniah actually tells us when this will happen. And this is something that so many people, I mean, there's so many people today, they think they know the divine name of, of, of God and they don't even know it. But Zephaniah says here in chapter 3, verse 8, Therefore wait you upon me, says the Lord, until the day that I rise up to pray for my determination is to gather the nations that I might assemble the kingdoms to pour upon them mine indignation, even all my fierce anger, for all the earth shall be devoured with the fire of my jealousy." For then will I turn to the people a pure language, and they may all call upon the name of the Lord to serve Him with one consent. So see, He tells you to wait upon Him, and He's going to reveal His name so you might be able to call upon Him, and that's when He's gathered the nations to come against Israel. That's an interesting thought, isn't it? Something maybe many of us hadn't even thought about before. So when Joel says, For in Mount Zion and Jerusalem shall be deliverance, as the Lord hath said, in the remnant of whom the Lord shall call. But notice what he says, Shall call on the name of the Lord, the yod heh vav hey. So many people think they know what it means, and God's already said He'll only reveal it in the time when He's gathered all the nations against Israel. They're not, they're not, they're not there against her yet. They're getting in position, though, aren't they? We must be getting mighty close. That's something I would certainly consider anyway. All right, back into Romans here. Um, I lost my place. I've made myself some notes, so let me go back and find it again here. Uh, but anyway, uh, there's, a, there's another passage I wanted to share with you as well. Uh, this is just something... Uh, let me go. Let me take you to Isaiah, two two different ones I want to share with you. Isaiah thirty one, chapter thirty one, verse four, and also we're going to go to Isaiah chapter thirty seven. All right, uh, just a couple of thoughts here to share with you here in closing on this message here. Just a, little, a short message, just to kind of get into the groove here of, of trying to, to to share some important insights here with you guys. All right, in Isaiah thirty one, verse four, for thus saith the Lord. Uh, for, for thus hath the Lord spoken unto me, like as in the lion, as a young lion roaring on his prey. When a multitude of shepherds is called forth against him, he will not be afraid of their voice, nor abase himself for the noise of them. So shall the Lord of hosts come down to fight for Mount Zion and for the hill thereof. I thought that was interesting. So when this big to-do is going to come over, the Temple Mount. That, that's what's going to cause the war. That's what's going to cause all the nations to gather there in Jerusalem. That's what will cause all the Arabic nations to come. That's what will cause the United States to come. That's what will cause Russia to come. That's what's going to cause all of them to come. Is if they go to building on there a third temple. I'm not talking about a Jewish temple being built. I'm talking about when Rome goes to build her third temple on there. It won't be her third one. It's actually going to be her first. But that's what will bring them all down. And that will be the day that you have the showdown. That's when you have Moses and Elijah return. And then you'll see a mighty showdown like we've never seen before. Another one I wanted to share with you, though, as well. And that was Isaiah 37, verse 33. And the re uh, one reason I wanted to share this with you here, and, and this is for the sake of politicians in Israel, etc., whether it be... Uh, well, you know, if for some chance out of the blue we might see uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu, uh, I, I do know Rabbi Yehuda Glick has watched our program from time to time, at least on Israeli News Live. I know he watches the program there. Uh, so we do know that there's people in the Knesset that do watch. Uh, but in Isaiah 37, this was something I wanted to just share with you. Everybody is so concerned over Syria. And this here is in verse 33, and I realize this was dealing, God's dealing with a, with a specific case where the king of Assyria had came down uh, and was threatening to take Jerusalem. But I like it this also because I look at this more prophetically speaking as well, that it applies even for today. 
He says here, thus for, thus, Therefore thus says the Lord concerning the king of Assyria, He shall not come into this city, nor shoot an arrow there, nor come before it with shields, nor cast a bank against it. By the way that, that he came, by the same shall he return, and shall not come into this city, saith the Lord, for I will defend this city to save it for mine own sake and for my servant David's sake. Then the angel of the Lord went forth and smote in the camp of the Assyrians a hundred and fourscore and five thousand. And when they arose early in the morning, behold, they were all dead corpses. You don't think he's not going to fight for it again here in the very near future? Sure he will. Sure he will. Now, I realize, like I said, this was a prophecy spoken back during, way back when Isaiah was prophesying. So even before the time of 70 AD when uh, the Romans came down to sack the city. Uh, and they say that the Syrians were there and helped to do that. But I don't think we have to do anything to worry about today. Anyway, I want to just share a little bit of this with you about uh, the branches, the, the wild and natural olive tree from Paul's writing in the book of Romans here, how it lines up. And also another thing just of interest as well, Paul likens us to the wild olive tree and the natural olive tree when he speaks about that and how that the, the natural branches can be regrafted, regrafted in again. And isn't it interesting that in Zechariah, when God speaks of the two witnesses there, which we know that because Revelation uh, 11 is when John tells us that they, these are the two olive branches spoken about, which is in Zechariah's prophecy, that again, they're spoken of as two olive branches or two olive trees on either side of the golden lampstand. I think that's kind of an interesting analogy as well. Anyway, I'm Stephen Benoon. You're watching the Noon Institute of Biblical Research, and we trust it's been a blessing to you. Shalom.